for you to turn in your Bibles to Malachi this morning, please. Malachi. That's the last book in the Old Testament. Find Matthew, back up a couple pages, you'll be there. I'm going to preach to you about a subject this morning that a lot of people don't like to hear, but it's a subject I have a great amount of joy in preaching about for some reason. That's about your money, about tithes and offerings. It's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. A little background here. I want to kind of give you the context in Malachi because Malachi gives us a pretty good picture in spirit of the subject about tithes and offerings. Now there is a difference between tithes and a difference between offerings. And we will teach about that, not at this particular time, but later as we go on, I'll be teaching about these kind of things. Hope to be teaching about a lot of things. Let's start with verse 6 of chapter 1. We want to get this picture first. <clears throat> Let's start at chapter Chapter 1, Malachi, verse 6, says this, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. Then, if I am a father, where is my honor? This is God speaking. And if I am a master, where is my respect? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priest who despise my name. But you say, How have we despised thy name? You are presenting defiled food upon your altar, but you say, How have we defiled thee? In that you say, The table of the Lord is to be despised. But when you bring, but when you present the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you present the lame and sick, is it not evil? Why not offer to your governor? Would he be pleased with you? Would he receive you kindly? Says the Lord of hosts. But now will you not entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us with such an offering on your part? Will he receive any of you kindly, says the Lord of hosts? Let me give you briefly here, 38,000 feet, what's going on. You know, if you know the law that God had required of the priest to make atonement for the people, and one of the requirements was that they bring a lamb or an offering without spot or blemish, Right? the very best of their flock. Now any farmer knows that <clears throat> the best of your flock has a tendency to produce more like itself. So if you want to become more profitable, you'd keep the very best that you had, especially a male, uh, lamb, goat, or whatever it would be. You'd keep that to propagate in your herd so that your herd would get better because the better your herd got, that's just like us today having a very profitable business, gaining and growing, right? And God had asked that. And God had made it very clear to the priests that they were not to accept any kind of offering except this offering of a lamb or an animal that was without spot or blemish. But what had happened was, you see, the priest, for whatever reasons were not told, had begun to accept from the people and begin to sacrifice animals that were weak and sick and had spot and blemishes. So when God calls them on a the matter, they basically said, hey, what are we doing? Aren't we sacrificing? Aren't we going, we're, we're doing it. We're, you, you told us to sacrifice. Well, basically what they were doing, they were going through the motions. But they were only going through the motions as far as a tradition, as far as a ritual, the understanding and the knowledge that they had in their heart of what God had expected them of them, they was letting that slide. <clears throat> and so God calls them on it. Then God begins to talk to the people. He's talking to the priests there. He says, you guys have let the standard down. You let the standard down, then the people let the standard down. You're, you're, you're taking in sick and weak animals when I've asked you to bring a, one to me without spot and blemish, and it just had a triple down effect. So they got over here. You get over here to uh, chapter 3, and we'll start up with verse 8. Now it would be best if you went home and read the entire book of Malachi, and, and look at it and pray about it and study it for yourself because the Holy Spirit can teach you far beyond uh, what any man can teach you or what any preacher can, can, can teach you. And you need to get the whole context. But we'll, we'll bust in here at chapter 3 at verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me, but you say, 
How have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house, and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows, then I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it may not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will your vine in the field cast its grape, says the Lord of hosts. And all the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightful land, <clears throat> says the Lord of hosts. If I could present something to you like a business or a partnership, and let's say that we were going into a business or a partnership or even a relationship with someone in agreement with them about, let's say, a business. Let's just take business, for example. You had a chance to go in business with someone that had completely unlimited resources. They had com just unlimited resources. They was always 100% perfectly honest. They always kept their word. They was even willing to give you a detailed contract publicly of their commitment to you and was willing to put down the agreements of this contract in such black and white that anyone could understand it. This business partner also possessed unlimited knowledge. Never made a mistake. And not only that, had all of that power, was willing to do all of that, but the essence of their heart was that they themselves was always looking out for your good and what was best for you. Even if it hurt them and cost them, they were still on your side. Would you not want to go in business with someone like that? Yes, you would. And you know where I'm headed. Amen? You need to give, church. Now, the church is not the person sitting next to you. It's not your neighbor. It's you. You're the church. If you are a blood-bought believer in Jesus Christ, you are the church. You are this people that God was talking to here in Malachi. Although it was Old Testament time, he was speaking to the Jews, and the Jews were God's covenant people. We are God's covenant people. You individuals who believe in Jesus Christ, whose blood has covered you, that's what the Christ means, means the cover, the smear. The blood of Jesus Christ has covered you. You are now his covenant people. And God wants you to give. Why should you give? That's a good question. I've had people ask me, why should I give? I want to say to you this morning, you should give because God gave. If Jesus Christ is in you and your life is to be like Christ, if God gave and the essence of his nature is giving, you should give. He gave us everything. We don't own one thing here on the face of the earth, not one thing. Everything you own is going to be somebody else's junk someday. Every rifle that sits in my gun cabinet that I take out and hold with such pride is going to be some rusted junk someday if I don't have to give it up before then, which I won't. But it's, still, it's going to be somebody else's junk someday. Every one of those pocket knives that I take out and look at and my boys have spoken for And every Christmas day, we get my knife collection out and we look at it. We wipe the knives down and we put them all back. And my boys argue over which ones they're going to get when I'm dead. Them two boys of mine can't wait till I die. But they're going to be somebody else's junk someday. They'll get lost. You see, God saw our plight. And he said, I'll give you my son. He not only gave us his son, and he not only gave us hope, and he not only brought salvation to our souls, but you are breathing the air right now that he made. I am alive and existing in God because Acts 17, 28 says that in him we move, exist, and have our being. And you're sitting there on your hind end with your ears working because God is. And he gave you the ability to sit there and to hear me this morning. He's given you your very life. God owns everything. Listen to Psalms 50, verses 10 and 12. 
for every beast of the forest is mine. That's why every deer I've ever killed, I've laid my hands on it and thank God for it. That may not fit in some of your thinking, but you don't live in my shoes. You live in your shoes, I'll live in mine. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird of the mountains and everything that moves in the field is mine, God says. Listen to Haggai 2.8. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord. And he has given all of this to us to enjoy. I don't know about you, but I enjoy life. Have I had some heartaches and tough times in it? You bet, just like you. But overall, I enjoy life. I enjoy doing things, and, and I like being alive. Do I have bad days? Absolutely. Do I get depressed? Absolutely. Is there oppression that comes to my soul? Absolutely. Do I have hope? More than all of it! And God has given me this to enjoy. I enjoy my family. I enjoy the church. Except when we get legalistic and rule making and there's trouble and all of that. Nobody enjoys that. But overall, I enjoy the church, amen, don't you? Not all of it. I enjoy pastoring. Not all of it. Some days I don't. But overall, I enjoy life. And God has given us all of this to enjoy. I want to ask you a question this morning. What do you have that God didn't give you? What do you have that God didn't give you? If the Bible is true, what do you have that God didn't give you? I think the, the, my answer for that is nothing. I don't have anything that God didn't give me. Does that mean that we owe God something? Well, no, not like we owe Him because He's indebted to us. We owe him because of an oughtness, because of the commandments of love, because of the essence and our understanding of love. How many of you would think I loved my wife if I never ever did anything or acknowledged her personhood or anything that she would like? If I only used her for what I wanted? And in my understanding of her and her nature and her personhood and the person she was, I never willfully did anything that would cause her to smile or anything that she would like. Would you say that I loved my wife? Yet there are many people that say they love God. Basically, they just want God to do for them what they want. And they fail to love God and know God and do back for God the essence of what God would want them to do to show his love for them, for him. I have found in my own life and by counseling and being a pastor in my own experience, I have found through the understanding and practice of life, plus from the word of God, that one of the last things that grace touches in people's lives is their pocketbook. We always major on, well, I don't smoke and I don't drink and I don't go to the movies. And I only give a dollar a week. Since nobody sees what you give, since we know that we're not the right hand isn't supposed to know what the left hand's doing, we run and hide in that one. We're not supposed to let the left hand know what the right hand's doing. No, we're not. That's not it, the right hand or the left hand. Of course, that's not it, but God does know what we're doing. God gave and we should give. And it's not just tithes and offerings. But I'm speaking this morning particularly of stewardship. Because that was the problem in Malachi's day and God addressed it. There's something else too I want to mention for you that's very real. We should give because of what giving will do for us. Does God ask us to give because he needs it? What can you give God that he needs? Who in here can pull God up by his bootstraps? God already owns everything. You give because of what it will do for you. God could have put this church 
on an oil field. Maybe it is. The Dixonville Wesleyan Church, how many of you know the Dixonville Wesleyan Church? They got two gas wells on their property. Fuels their church, they have a good income and everything off of it. That's great. God doesn't really need anything. But I know this. There is somehow, and I cannot explain it, the only way I can explain it is because God's promised it, and so that's the way it is. I know that when you give, it feels good. I know that when you give, God blesses. I know that when you give, sometimes you come up short, and you can't operate to the way that you've had plans. But I know that if you by faith gave and you give because you love God and because you know that's what God wants you to do, even when things get tough, somewhere, somehow, God comes through and your heart is made so happy. And the world is looking for a happy heart. The world does not have a happy heart because the world never gives. It takes. But God has given and so should the Christian. Why? Because of what it will do for us. God has our best interest in mind. I know so many people that are miserable. They're unhappy. Most people's misery and, and, and unhappiness comes about somewhere in the relationship of materialism in some way. How many of you really, how many of you kind of despise cars? Because they're expensive, aren't they? And yet you got to, but nobody's going to ride a bike. And yet cars are a real pain in the neck sometimes. God loves you this morning. He has your best in mind. God wants you to give because giving does something for you. It gives God a chance to witness to your heart in the spirit, not in your thinking, but in the spirit. When you give and you're obedient in those things, then he witnesses to your spirit. If a rich man would take care of everything that was went on in your life, you would not be happy. I can remember in, uh, well, this is only my second pastor, so I've not had a very large line of experience with a lot of churches, but I can remember uh, at, at Hess Road, we, uh, did, we, we did all of those things that the church is supposed to do, and I looked like a real successful pastor and all of that kind of stuff, the way people keep score, building and numbers and all of those kind of things. And I remember when we were in a building program, a very good friend of mine who was a very wealthy man, he was on his deathbed and he knew it, and I went in to see him, we were talking, and we had just built a, uh, quite a sanctuary and things. And this man said to me, he said, Pastor Bowie says, I'm going to change my will and I'm going to will it that everything financially be taken care of for the church. I took him by the hand and his name was Bunny. Larry. His name, real name was Lawrence. We called him Bunny. I said, Bunny, you'll not do no such a thing. Those people need to give because they need to learn that God blesses and he wants them to give. That would be the worst thing that you could do for the church. Now, I imagine somebody in the right thing would say, Hallelujah, praise the Lord, he's going to pay it all off. That's not biblical. That's not scriptural. To say, well, the, the Lord laid it on the man's heart. No, he didn't say that. He just said that that's what, something he'd like to do. He had plenty of money, wasn't it? I said, no, Ray. And I think one of the reasons that the church grew, and I believe one of the reasons that a church grows is when people give because they know that it's pleasing to the Lord and they love the Lord and the Lord blesses their heart and makes them happy and it's contagious. And people want to come be part of that. There's nothing so downtrodden as some sanctified, blessed, set in their ways, somebody that ain't got no need at all and no joy in their heart. Hello. Hello. God promises to us, and I know from my own experience that giving brings joy and happiness to your heart. 
You say, have you ever had hard times? Yeah, I've had hard times. I could tell story after story after story. In fact, I'm going to tell you a story. Tommy and Mandy are back there, and, and they're talking, and they need to listen to me. Thank you. Um, Tommy, you know this guy. Tommy is a young man that grew up in our home. And uh, he's not a he's, a, he's a man now. He's from a boy. And I buried his mommy. And anyway, Dick Wainer was a man that I led to Christ. Discipled him. And usually when I lead someone to Christ, I disciple them one-on-one -on -one for a minimum of 13 weeks. And old Dick was really growing and we have this book that we follow, you know, um, Growing in Christ. <laughs> Dick Wainer was a diesel mechanic. And he worked up in Buffalo, which was an hour away, or down in Buffalo, which was an hour away. And, and Dick smoked. And, of course, me being a pastor and how we take smoking and the use of tobacco and all that stuff, which is, I'm, I'm not for it, but I'm not going to point my finger and, Old Dick, we was in that uh, discipling program, and one night when, when we were discipling together, we had spent some time in prayer, and he got up, and I could see that he was under quite a strain, and I said, what's the matter, Dick? You having a problem, something wrong? And I'd been praying, you know, that the Lord would speak to him about his tobacco, and in my heart of hearts, and Dick said, yeah, he says, I got, the Lord's really dealing with me about something, and I'm having a real hard time with it, and I, in my heart of hearts, going, all right, he's going to quit smoking, you know. And, uh, I said, well, what is it? We had never, never once had I mentioned, we had not done any lesson on tithing, giving, nothing, nothing. Hadn't preached on it. He was a brand new Christian. He didn't, and believe me, he was brand new. He didn't know up from down. But the Lord had saved him. He was so tender in his heart. He said, the Lord's dealing with me about money, giving. And it just shocked me. I says, he is. He says, yeah. And I says, well, like what? And then he told me. He said, God is wanting me to. He said to me, I feel that he's telling me this. It doesn't make sense to me. He wants me to give so much. He says, you know, he says, that, he says that's about a tenth of what I make. Now, this is from a brand new Christian. Didn't know nothing about tithing, did he, honey? He was just, I'm telling you, if you knew him, you, you just got to believe me. I says, he is. He says, yeah. And he says, Pastor Bo, he says, I'm not, I'm not making it now. He said, if, if he says, I, I'm not making it now. He says, some weeks, he says, I have to borrow $5 off of my dad for gas to get to work just to make, make my bill. He says, I can't do it. It's impossible. I said, Dick, I said, it's God. If you believe that's God, and he was, he was under conviction. I says, if that's God tell you that, I says, you have to do it. Don't worry about if it's not going to work or what you can think. You just mind the Lord. You mind it. But he couldn't do it. I says, well, you keep praying about it. Well, the very next week, he did. He tithed. Now, this is without any teaching or instruction on a pastor's part, no discipling, no nothing. He tithed. He told me, and that, that next week he told me, he says, well, I did it. I said, did what? He says, I wrote out a check for a tent. He says, I, I, says, I don't know how I'm going to make it. I says, don't worry about it. Wednesday, before prayer meeting, he called me. I never heard a man so pumped up in all my life. He was so happy. He says, guess what? I said, what? And there was a volunteer fire company just down the road from where Dick lived. And they had all of these big diesel trucks and everything. And they was on contract to this very diesel service place that Dick worked at. Well, his boss said to him, and he was down to where he had to get gas and didn't have any gas and didn't have any money. And he was ashamed to go to his dad and ask him for more. His boss said, you know that fire company, don't you live down there by Barker, New York? He says, that fire company down there, he says, all their fleet, their fleet, needs to be serviced and they want to bring it would you mind driving that fleet back and forth you could pick it up on your way to work and drive it to work and service it and drive it back Dick Wainer ended up after two months period of time had more money than he ever had in his life because God would find him a way to drive another vehicle to work 
and instead of coming up short on gas money, he had more gas money than he ever had. And if Dick Wainer was here today, he could tell you that story. And you cannot make that man not tithe. He fears God in his heart. And he's learned the joy of giving. He is one of the most giving men I have ever met in my entire life. In fact, the muzzle shotgun, that, the muzzle rifle that I got now was his very best gun. When, he, when I was coming to Pennsylvania, he says, you're going to need a rifle, Pastor, here. He gave me his rifle. I suppose God's given him three or four by now. I, I don't know. But I'm telling you, it'll bless your heart. When you, in your spirit, do like these people in Malachi did, go through the motion. Just not really be obedient. You can't, you can't, well, you can say that I give. You know, but is it in the knowledge that you have in your relationship with God? There are spiritual blessings which come from tithing. Tither senses a joy of being in partnership with God. You sense a joy in your heart of being obedient, of doing what you know you ought. Sometimes that's not easy, but it's always best. And I'll tell you something, there is a negative side to this. God does pronounce a curse on the non-tither. I'm the most unhappiest people and struggling people and the people who think they're not going to ever make it and are always having trouble financially. I have experienced are the non-tithers. Why do I say that? He says this. If you, he says if you... I'll per, pronounce a curse on you if you don't. But if you do tithe, he says, then I will rebuke the devourer for you, verse 11, so that it may not destroy the fruits of the ground. Nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. It's been my experience. You say, well, it's just coincidence. It's not coincidence. It's been my experience. People that don't tithe, just about the time they're getting ahead, the freezer goes out. Just about the time they think they're going to make it, the, 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 the car breaks. Just about the time. Hello? Huh? Just about the time you get to where you're going to get, and another setback comes along. But when you mind the Lord, the freezers keep running. You say, Pastor, now you're, you're pulling my leg. You'll have to try him. <laughs> I'm just saying, he says right here. I'm just saying, you are cursed with the curse for you're robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Test me in this. I didn't say that. God says it's the only place in the entire word of God. He says, try me. Test me. Test me in this. You do this, then I will rebuke the devourer for you. Is there something always seeming to devour your life? Always something seeming to consume and keep you behind? Some pressure on you all the time? Just devouring your joy. like we did. Are you all with me this morning? Man, you're just sitting there. Okay. Now, I'm going to end on this. i got a lot more to say. There are some Christians that say about the subject of tithing, he says that uh, we're not to tithe now. That was an Old Testament thing. And now we're under grace. And, it's a, and this is a New Testament and a new dispensation. That's a big word that I'll teach sometime. A new dispensation and everything is different. Well, that part's true, but I want you to know this. In the Old Testament, words like faith, atonement, redemption, righteousness, sin, all of those words that we like so well today, all of those have their origin in the Old Testament. They're not New Testament words. They're Old Testament words. The big mistake we often make, we say if it's in the Old Testament, it's under the law. That's wrong. That is absolutely wrong. The law is not a faith, Paul did say in Galatians 3.12. But I want you to know this. Men like Abel, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph... They all did, the Bible says, what they did by faith. The Bible testifies that every one of them tithed and every one of them lived before the law was given. Then there were men that came after the law. 
The Bible testifies that they did what they did by faith. So you see, it's still a matter of faith. Nowhere in the entire Word of God, nowhere in the New Testament, nowhere ever in Jesus' teaching did he ever repeal the law of tithing or giving. In Matthew chapter 23, he gets after the guys because, it's after some of the Pharisees, not for tithing, but because they were tithing with the wrong motive and spirit. You say, why didn't Jesus ever teach about tithing? Why should he teach and rattle on about something that everybody understood? Hello? Well, I'll tell you this. Even if it's not scriptural, even if I'm not convinced, even if you haven't convinced from a scriptural point of view, if you have any doubts about the matter, I'll just make this very reasonable proposition for you. I would rather give God the benefit of the doubt anyway. Amen? <laughs> I really would. Why? Because God wants you to know him. You are a steward. You don't own anything. And may I remind you that being a steward is a very high place and position. How many of you would hire you who... If anybody here, is, I know I've got an uncle that was very wealthy, and he had a he he didn't even handle his money. He had somebody to handle all of his money for him, and he would tell him, "Well, you've got to spend so much this year. If you don't spend so much this year, you're going to lose so much." So he had to spend so much money, and he had to give so much money away for tax breakets and all it's all those things that I don't understand. Now, if somebody had here had enough money like that and you wanted somebody else to be a steward of your money wouldn't you want an honest steward <laughs> amen so a steward is a very high place and position it's a position of place and honor that God has given us to demonstrate one part in one area of our life to demonstrate to him that we love him and we know that money is the God of this world and we shouldn't let it rule us. We should allow the love of God to rule in our hearts and not be like these people of Malachi, fudging around on the matter. You all with me? I'd like for you to stand. You've probably heard this story. It was about the manager of a local grain elevator and he was asked to be the treasurer of the church he didn't want a job but everybody kept after him he was a very good businessman he was very well trusted and so they wanted him to be the treasurer of the church and so finally he agreed to take the position but he would take it only under two conditions number one that no report from the treasurer be given for an entire year he didn't want anybody asking him. He didn't want the board knowing. He didn't want nothing. He would be the treasurer of the church. But for the entire one year, nobody would say anything to him. If they trusted him, that he would take it then. So they agreed. Number two, he asked no one ask him any questions at all, period, during that time. In any kind of way, roundabout, fishing, or anything. Or go to the bank. Everybody would take their hands completely off of it. They agreed. It was in a rural farming community, and most of the members in the church did their business with him. They brought their grain to the elevator and everything. And at the end of the year, he gave this report. The indebtedness of $25,000 had been paid. Staff salaries were increased. The mission quota had been upped by 200%. There were no outstanding bills, and the cash balance was $12,000. Immediately, a shocked congregation asked, how can this be? Quietly, he answered, most of you bring your grain to me, and as you did, I simply withheld 10% on your behalf. And you never missed it. Father, 
Thank you for your grace and mercy on us every day. I believe with all of my heart, Heavenly Father, that the church today, all of us, are like the times of Malachi. We rob you. And so we have problems and the devourer eats us and we have no joy. We hope in our plans and in our programs and we create new ideas and new things trying to generate energy and trying to generate a, your spirit in the church. But you have said that if we rob you, your spirit will not be there. And so we thank you again for your mercy and for your grace. Bless these people, Heavenly Father, with the joy in their hearts when they give. Thank you for your promises. Amen. Let me have your attention just for a moment. I want you to go home and think about this. I know how it is. You get out of here and you go do your own thing, but I want you to think about this message. I also am going to state something publicly now that I, if I continue to pastor this church when I went I plan to and hope to. I've already said this to the board. The board did not give me permission to say this, nor do I need the board's permission to say what I'm going to say. I am aiming for and will be working with the board, and one of my desires is to change the finances of the church, to restructure it. It is my conviction that the pastor should not be paid out of a salary. I am not a hired man. I am here because God has called me. The church is run like a business, and the board and I are going to be working on this and making some changes. Some of you may not like it, because it will be a change from tradition. But I have got to head in the direction I feel God is calling me. And I want to head in the direction of not receiving a salary. I am not your hired man. And this is not a business. This is the church of God. And so I'm going to be working on those things, and there'll be some rough roads. But I hope to get to the place where I'm living as the priest did and as Paul and every other minister of the gospel did off of the love of the people. That wouldn't be tithing, that would be offerings. And I just want you to know we're going to be heading that way. It won't be fast because I have a lot of teaching to do. There's a lot of things that you understand. I just can't make changes without you understanding it and feeling a part of it. But I'm being very upfront with you right now off the bat and telling you where I'm heading. Because I don't do anything under the covers. I am not a sneaky person. That's what they accused Paul of being, you know, sneaky. Now you can accuse me of that, but I'm just telling you right up front. So we're going we're to be looking at some changes. They'll be coming about slowly as I teach and as I work with the board on this. Okay, I just want you to know that up front. All right? All right. Now you fathers... Yes. Yes. Golden Ager's dinners, Thursday, 1130. Thank you, Connie. All right, husbands, you go home, pay attention to your wives, love your wives, be the head of the home. Husbands, okay? And start giving. Bye.